Aloha and welcome to Author Talk. I'm Lori coming at you from the beautiful big island of Hawaii and I'm so excited about my author today, Jordan P. Barnes. His book is One Hit Away, A Memoir of Recovery. And um, also he is the winner of the Indies Today Book Award for 2020. So he's got um, an award for the best book of the year. So that should tell you right there his book is beautifully written his story is amazing um it's profound and um it's it is his memoir of recovery from addiction but i i really feel like it's got something for everybody in there so welcome jordan aloha <laughs> good afternoon happy aloha sunday thank you so much for having me yes thank you for being here and joining me today so um so you didn't you didn't ease us in <laughs> to your story at all with chapter one um no. so yeah you know my chin hit the floor and then pretty much stayed there um the the whole book so um so just just give us a little bit of kind of contrast i know you were or uh, context you're living in in portland um living mm -hmm. on the streets in portland so tell us a little bit about yourself so I'm from here. I'm from Hawaii. I grew up on Oahu and I went to Portland for college in 2003. Now my entire young adult life, I struggled with addiction in some sort. It was mainly alcoholism. When I was a teenager, I started experimenting with drugs. And when I went to Portland, like they say, I took myself with me. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Portland, my drinking had escalated continuously and it was just like they say, it was getting worse, never better. And long story short, I, I had a, a, a fateful night. I basically made a decision. Someone offered me what, what I, I believe to be a way out from drinking. And it was heroin and it went downhill rapidly. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately, my story is similar to a, a lot of people who, who, fall, who fall into that trap. They, they maybe have no idea what to expect when it hits them and they get blindsided. Mm -hmm. And I just also have an addicted personality. So within short order, homeless, strung out on the streets, stopped talking to my family. I had no self-confidence. I had no self-respect. I didn't know where I was going. I was just running amok. And that life doesn't, doesn't mess around. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't take any prisoners. You basically are very fortunate if you can make it out. I'm, I'm really fortunate because I know that I have a loving family that never gave up on me, even after I had long given up after on myself. Mm -hmm. And I also am fortunate that there's so many healthcare professionals and harm reduction for providers that were there to allow people like me experiencing such severe and traumatic addiction to potentially leave that one day with minimal health effects and, and, and lasting um, ramifications and and that's it so i'm i'm really fortunate i'm really fortunate that i found a place like sand island treatment center which is my home group that's mm -hmm. where i got sober that's where i learned a lot about myself and a lot about the different aspects to making a program of recovery and a lot of that went into my book and the reason i made my book was to keep what you have you have to give it away and mm -hmm. i wanted to share that story and i thought it was really important for parents and loved ones of addicts to read it because yes. honestly that's who this that because this is my story but it's my family story it's mm -hmm. my mom my dad it, it's my aunties my uncles my mom's best friend in church that prayed for me like it's it's a huge you know how it is it's a huge yes. community everyone is your family here in hawaii and um so that was really important to me was to tell not just my story but the story of those around me including the healthcare professionals at sand island yes and, and, you, and that you, was you you did it you did it so well and i'm so glad that you brought in kind of your parents plight and the family and and really all of the support around you um because yeah. otherwise you 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 can't make it i mean you need that support and you know i was just so thrilled that your parents you know stuck with you and mm -hmm. and all of that um so that's a big testament to them because you know they were in agony you know yeah. so when you yeah. when you moved to portland you you had already kind of been an alcoholic or drinking as a teenager when yeah. when when the person introduced you to heroin did you know already that you were like an addict that you were addicted to alcohol 
for sure. Okay. Totally. I mean, I had, I had a DUI at 16. I had a DUI at 17. I was binge drinking for weeks on end okay. and I was recently hospitalized from, uh, effectively violent vomiting that mm. collapsed my lung and they thought it tore my esophagus. So I was in like a really bad spot. I really was drinking myself to death. I, I wasn't confused about that. I knew I had an issue. I tried to get help. I'd done AA. I'd done counseling. I was, mm -hmm. my dorm had me on probation and I was on like the last straw. So I, yeah, it was no bones about it. And it's, um, it's something I'd struggled with my whole life. And it's yeah. also, it's also pretty strong in my family. So mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely, yeah. I definitely knew I had an issue with drinking. Okay. So, but, but in your, in your mind, you thought, oh, I'll, I'll take heroin and then that'll get me to stop drinking, but never even occurred to you that you would then become addicted to heroin. Like that's Kinda. just not so, the thought process. Well, I thought it was, I thought it was opium. <laughs> like it makes a difference, right? Like that's what I was told, but I also was willing to do anything to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. Right. So like in some regards, like when they say an addict has to be ready, has to be ready for help. I was ready for help. I was just asking the wrong person for help, <laughs> right? Like I was, I, I didn't know what I was walking into, but I also didn't care because I was running away from something. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you try heroin and like you said, it just basically took you down really fast. Um, yeah. and so, um, now, now basically after a series of events, you drop out of college and you're, you're living on the streets of Portland, like, like you're a junkie on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think we yeah. all, I mean, I think everybody has an addict in their life, whether it's immediate family, friend, extended family. Um, but it's another thing to like be a junkie on the street. I mean, that's, um, not, not everybody knows that so, like the depth of that. And so, um, yeah. Well, let's just start with chapter one. <laughs> um, sure. So, so it, you've, it's probably been a while now that you've been on the streets and, and you've sunk yeah. real low. And so yeah. you, but you've got, you know, your addict friends or your street friends around you and you found a place to, to sleep near a, a church or I think it was a synagogue. Um, it was kind yeah. of a, a, in my mind, I pictured a doorway, but I don't think that's what it was. But anyway, somewhere out of the weather and you wake up and what happens when you woke up that morning, the next morning after going to sleep with your friend near the church? I, I went to wake up my friend and I discovered he had, he had died in his sleep. I know that he was previously uh, incarcerated and he was incarcerated for long enough for his tolerance to drop. And when they let him out, this is a this is a really common issue. This mm -hmm. is actually, in fact, the statistics of uh, your chance of overdosing goes up 70% after two days of incarceration because your tolerance drops so low. So my friend came out and he knew this. He, he was he was cognitive of the fact that his tolerance was low. So he was taking it easy. But really, I mean, it's it, math, like like Haven says, math is hard. It's hard to judge what you have, how much you have mm. and what you're doing. And so he had basically done a shot, laid down asleep next to me. We both fell asleep and and he had passed away in his sleep. And I woke up to discover his body next to me. And it was horrible, as anyone could imagine. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, you don't think of those things, right? Um, but, but it was also like just a few sentences after that when I went, okay, this guy was a legit <laughs> heroin addict on the street because your friend is there deceased on the sidewalk. Yeah. But then what do you do? Rifle through his pockets for dope. You know, so there's, there's things that. I could take to the grave with me, right? There's things that I could, I could just never tell anyone about. No one needs to know. I can just internalize them and keep them to myself. But I had to make a decision. Do I be honest or do I be brutally honest? And I decided that I really wanted to tell people what I felt was one of my personal lowest lows because I need people to know that you, if you're struggling with addiction, because so many other people are 
at that same low or lower, mm -hmm. there's you, you can make it out, right? So I wanted people to know that, you know, it's not that I'm a bad person. It's not, it's not that I didn't care about my friend or that I didn't love him or that I wanted to disrespect him. It's that I had a raging addiction that mm -hmm. I had to feed yeah. at all costs. And, yes. and that was one of the costs was, was doing something like that. And I just think that that was really important to share um, because I think it says a lot about the fact that we do recover and, and that it's okay. It's okay to be open about those things, but what, but what are you going to do with it? You know, it, mm -hmm. it's not okay if you just, you're just doing stuff like this all the time and you don't, you don't use it to change for the better. Right. But if you use it as, as a source of motivation to improve your life or possibly improve the life of others, then, then we can make something good of a horrible situation. Yes. Yes. Because I thought, okay, that that's, you know, that's heavy. That was heavy. Mm -hmm. But then I just, you know, here you've got an award-winning book. And so it really, I thought that was just the contrast that really showed how far you came, how far you can come. It doesn't matter how low, how down you are. You can, you can make it out. And so that's what mm -hmm. I loved um, about that and appreciated about you putting that scene in there. It's real, it's raw. It, yeah. it, it happened and it happens, right? Um, yeah. Addictions are um, not your friend, really. I, uh, I also I also want to add that I did I was so I was so under under the weather and using that I didn't have a chance to process that when it happened, right? So I didn't leave and and go cry somewhere. I was mm -hmm. numb to emotion. Mm -hmm. By reaching out to the Portland Police Bureau and requesting the death report and going in and going back to Beth Israel Synagogue and doing all this research at a later date to go back and process it was really healing in and of mm -hmm. itself because it gave me closure that I never granted myself back when that happened. I just sort of swept it under, under the rug, talk, did it with my four step, but then I didn't remember a lot of those things. And I just kind of, it was all like, uh, it was, I was just trying to get rid of everything, right? Yes. I didn't want to process it. So uh, very, very healthy to, to, to write about that yes it, it, because it gets it out outside yeah. of you yeah and then again helps it helps you know somebody else this keeps coming out of my ear but um so another another thing that i didn't realize and is probably common um on the street is um you had wrote about um because you carried around a dope kit and that that um that actually surprised me a little bit just because of like the thievery, right? And the selfishness. Um, and, you know, when somebody needs a hit, you'll rifle through a dead person's pocket, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it, I was surprised when I read that, even though it may be common. But the other thing that just, that I really ha couldn't fathom um, until I read it was that you actually carried um, Narcan in your dope kit and so that's the thing that's what you use yeah. if you overdose right mm -hmm. yeah and so yeah. why did you carry that around i mean um i have saved like I, ca I carried it around because it was given to me so to start narcan naloxone is distributed from harm reduction services like the syringe exchange a lot of people think a needle exchange all they do is give junkies needles and they use like terminology terminology like that that's like kind of like puts people down for what they mm -hmm. do but mm -hmm. there's so much more that goes on to it there's yeah. overdose awareness overdose prevention counseling i'm i'm starting a whole nother book right now based on uh, a, a syringe exchange and the efforts that go into harm reduction but that was given to me and and it's funny you'll see i was talking to haven who runs that exchange and she's also in my book as, as you know and she was telling me she'll, you'll see a meme like why do addicts get needles when diabetics have to pay for their mm -hmm. insulin mm -hmm. for, and the thing is addicts don't get these needles for free they're given to us for free but the syringe exchange pays for them right so they pay for them and give them out and it's the same thing with narcan and it's the same thing with naloxone and i carried it with me because it was given to me and the more people that have that or have access to that the more people can save lives or have their own life saved with their own that happens too and then people can go on and and if they if they get out if they choose to change their life for the better they can go on and live happy healthy productive lives mm -hmm. 
we don't we're not forever going to be this addict in this horrible spot so i carried it with me because it was given to me and i think that i was very fortunate because i've saved people with it and i've i've been saved with it and a lot of people had it too it wasn't just me that had it so mm -hmm. i think it's a beautiful thing that they've that they're doing that 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 program in portland sounded uh, like a really great program and um, yeah. very, very effective. Um, <clears throat> uh, you also had, um, I like to just say angels. Um, I think, uh, actually I think your, your parents or maybe your dad specifically referred to somebody as an angel. And um, I, uh, that's why I like to read, uh, you know, when I read people's memoirs and then as the reader, you know, you can see all the little angels, you know, all the little kind of divine interventions that, that help you uh, when you're not helping yourself, right? And yeah. so um, you had um, you had gone to the police station or you were going to the jail. Um, I don't remember now exactly why, but you look up and there's a lady trying to get in the door in the wheelchair. And then, mm -hmm. and then this, this was also when you just, you just, you know, the person has an addiction. They're not bad. They they still have a heart. They've got a soul. And so I thought this particular scene brought that out in you. And I thought, okay, he, you know, he's gonna be all right. You know, that's when I um, thought that. So what? What? How? How did that all go down? The, so yeah. I yeah. So I was accompanying my friend, the same one who unfortunately passed away. So. I opened my book with that scene, but then I went back yeah. and, and I was going with him and he was going to collect He had previously been arrested and they held on. I think it was cash. I think he had to go and sign out. He had too much cash for them to give him or that's, I, we were there and um, I was outside. He had gone in and I was sniping cigarettes from the ashtrays and there was a woman just freaking out, trying to get into, get into the door. And I went to help her out. And um, you're absolutely right. My mom and dad were in, immediately conv convinced and still convinced she was she was put there to to put me because she, right then my, my dad was there and they were sent to the wrong place to begin with. So there was so many. It's hard to say there. You know, it's hard to say there are coincidences. Now, I'll admit that I had a hard time believing this and thinking this. And I didn't want to think that there was angels mm -hmm. or that God was looking out for me at that time. I was mm -hmm. so I was so in myself and in my like worldly woes that it was extremely difficult for me to even accept that there was someone out there looking out for me. But in hindsight, when I go, when I look at my life and my story, and these are just some of the things I write about, I've had so many instances where someone was watching out for me and where I am fortunate to be sitting here today with you to tell my story. And yeah, that was, that was, they, they call it a God shot. You can, there's all sorts of names for it, but that was just good, good looking out to put me in that spot. And, and it was, and it was fortuitous because my parents were looking for me in the city with no idea where to start looking. And within short order, they found me and, and that was it. And that was the beginning of a grueling and arduous process to eventually land myself in, in treatment. Yeah. That, that story was just, mind blowing because they had just flown in from Hawaii. Yeah. 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 And just right there at the same at the same time it could have only been, you know, divine. Yeah, um, they had no contact with me whatsoever. My mom was talking to the sheriff. She was tr uh, tracking me by my arrest records and so she knew I was supposed to be at court the next day and so she was coming the day early, flying up a day early just to like figure out where court was so she could be there. Right? So like she was planning to like surprise me <laughs> but but i but i wasn't going to court i wasn't going to go to court i i i was always releasing my own recognizance and then i would just run and get a bench warrant and then it would just go on uh you know so like even her plan was never going to happen i wasn't going to be there that's the last thing i was going to do is show up and be incarcerated for anything yes yeah. yeah and so everybody had a surprise that day and so um <laughs> yeah so mom and dad are relieved that you're alive um so so that was good and then i know you know they were with you for a couple days um but you you, you still you, like you said that was your the beginning of your process but you still had to you know go out and 
figure out some things as, as I say there's still some things on the street to figure out um, mm -hmm. and I definitely you know want to talk about Sand Island and the treatment and everything but there was just a couple other things that to me were so sure. mind-blowing just just because I don't don't know that world um, you know the addicts and stuff I knew were functioning essentially um, but so so what was a day a day like I know you were you were stealing things um, it, it, you, you wrote in your book that like you poked yourself a hundred times a day or so so tell, tell mm -hmm. us like basically what a day was like at your life at that time being an addict uh, being strung out on heroin and homeless is a horrible existence. There's nothing good to say about it. There is nothing that feels good about it. My days, I refer to them, it felt like Groundhog Day. You, you feel like you're going no, nowhere. You wake up unmotivated. You hate yourself. You're sick. You're cold. You're wet. Some, you're miserable. You, you, you already start your day off on the wrong side of the bed. You don't even have a bed to start on. It's, there's nothing good about it. And it's really, it's just chasing something. I read this in a review about my book. Someone's like, Jordan's story is basically chasing something that wants to kill you. And that's exactly, when I heard that, I'm like, that's exactly what it is. It's something that doesn't care about you. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's miserable. All day you're stealing. I was, I mean, I was stealing. People have different hustles. Some people can sell drugs and and pay for their habit that way. Some some people do other things. I was a booster, so I would just steal and trade and steal and trade. And that anxiety of mm -hmm. constantly at risk of being arrested, and then what that means for your addiction, it's it's really unsettling. And it's just it's terrible. I am I'm so fortunate to be where I am, and I'm coming up on ten years clean and sober. Right I'm so blessed that I don't think. I, there's people that are, they call them dry drunks and they, they basically are long-term recovery and they like hate life mm -hmm. and, and they, they just, they miss it. I don't have any of that. I'm so blessed and fortunate that there's, I look back and all of that was just horrible. So there's, there's no romance, there's no romance with the streets. I even wrote like you think you can confuse like freedom for not having a job. It's not, that's not it. There's no freedom being strung out and addicted to something because you have no choice you have no choice you have to basically okay you do have a choice but it feels like you have no choice right. is i guess my point mm -hmm. and um and that's it's just it's it's miserable and you're right i poked myself i've always had bad veins and i was an iv heroin user and i was also at the end doing speed balls which is heroin and cocaine mm -hmm. and i was I don't want to get too graphic, but it was not, it was not healthy. And it was basically, I was just destroying myself and it took yeah. a long time to physically and mentally, but mainly physically recover from, from that damage. And there's some parts of me that won't recover and that's also okay. That's just part of my, part of my story. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and just you now, um, even with some ailments that, you know, are going to hang on, um, you you look healthy you seem healthy so it's just it's just another testament to how remarkable our bodies are you yeah, know once yeah. you once you give them what they need um and and i like what you said and our spirits and our spirits yeah, too, oh yeah it's, oh, yeah that's it sure. that's a huge part yeah and so um you you finally you know you've had it um you get to the the medical detox. Your your parents come again. Uh, just just I just love the way that you included your parents in your story. Um, and you know I could just feel their codependence like early on, um, but they they're showing tough love now. Um, you know mm -hmm. by this point. So kudos to them. Um, but so now you're you you've come back to Hawaii and. Mm -hmm. You get into Sand Island um, Treatment Center, yeah. which is a two-year treatment yeah. center. So that's a long time. Um, so, so like, what were your first days like in treatment? So I didn't know it was two years when I showed up. It, and I don't think my parents knew. And if they did, they didn't tell me. I didn't really know what I was going to. I sort of ran from a lot of issues. So I like was fleeing something to somewhere else. Yeah. And a lot of that was because of my friend's passing and, and other felony warrants and stuff. 
and I was just, I was willing to, to go. And I'm fortunate because I'm fortunate that I had a medi medicated detox at Hooper detox and that mm -hmm. helped, mm -hmm. but I also didn't sleep for the first month and it was really, really difficult. And Sand Island expects if, if, if at all possible, they want you to get a medical detox. If you're coming straight off an active addiction before you go into their program. And, and that's what I did. And it was still really tough. And a lot of people don't make it through the first 30 days. It's actually a blackout period. Mm -hmm. So they don't want you talking to your family. They don't want you talking to your wife, your husband, your kids, no one that could set you off. They just want you to kind of like calm down, take a deep breath, realize that life is changing for the better, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's mm -hmm. the goal. Um, and, and that's it. And I, I know that there's all sorts of different treatment programs out there and there's a lot of effective ways to address a habit. I can't imagine a short term program working for me. One, I've tried it in the past and it didn't work. But two, having not slept for the first three days, I wasn't even receptive and, and awake half the time to, to listen to people trying to help be impactful in my life. Mm -hmm. And and so it took a long time and it was really tough. and. The longer I stuck it out, stuck it out, the easier it got, and the easier it got. But so, I had a I had a voucher to fly back because our plane got derailed to Seattle, and so it was like this turmoil, this constant battle. Like I can leave if I want to, like I don't want to, I can though. And it was I was like, was, don't you dare! <laughs> I, and I had I not only had a voucher, but I had a temporary paper license that was going to expire. And I was like, I can still go back to Portland up until my license expires. After that. I don't have any identification to get onto an airplane. And that's just my thinking. Like it was sick thinking. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. But that's okay. That's okay. That's part of the process. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm glad that, I'm glad to have gone to a place like Sand Island. I can't say enough good things about them. Yes. Yeah. And, and you, you, you know, gave them lots of props, um, which was very nice. And so you, but you, you go from just the, the life of a drug addict on the street to a very structured situation yeah. so um you know what a stark you know contrast again from just from daily life having to live a schedule um but yeah. then then you i don't know if this was early on um but it's at some some lecture and and the people that were around you what you wrote was i can relate like you you, you were relating to what they were saying and they'll understand what you're yeah. going through kind of like that was the first time maybe ever that you were that you felt like people understood yeah yeah, yeah. that's so for those that don't know almost everyone that staff at sand island has gone through the program at least mm -hmm. once not all of almost all of them and most of them are addicts in long-term recovery themselves and so they know what we're going, they, they have that real empathy that, they, that, that people like me need to hear to understand things are gonna be okay. And for me to trust that things can be okay and I can look at them and be like, well, if they can do it and, and it's working for them, then, it, mm -hmm. th then there is a chance. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, it doesn't happen quickly, but the fact that I could relate to them, that was really, that was really important and, and I still relate to them. And, Ironically, now the roles have reversed, and I'm the one with coming up on ten years clean and sober, and other mm -hmm. kids, other clients can look to me, and and and, this, and it's the same thing, and then thus it, a cycle continues, but a healthy cycle. Kind of beautiful if you think about it. Oh yeah, yeah, just really beautiful, and um, so they, um, it 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 seemed like you know uh, another thing was that they're that they kind of kept saying to, especially in the beginning was there's no rush. Of course, you know, it's a, it's a two year, yeah. two year deal. But, um, I feel like maybe they weren't really saying that because you have two years, but, but as in this isn't, this takes time, like really trying to tell you and press upon you, the new people, this just takes time. You know, you can't rush this. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. And then, like the dirty secret that no one wants to tell you when you're new or that you don't want to hear is that it's a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. No one like that would just freak you out. You're like, what? <laughs> like the rest of my life. But that's the ultimate goal. That's my ultimate goal is to die sober. I'm going, I'm going to do it. I mean, yeah. to me, there's it, that's, I'm just going to do it. 
but that they broke it up in chunks to kind of, you know, like they say, day by day, people do minute by whatever. They break it up to make it um, digestible mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it helps. I mean, it helps because you're right. It's a lot to take in. You're at least I wasn't in the mindset that um, that this was going to be something that was attainable even to begin with. And so for them to kind of help me help guide me through that was was really cool and mm -hmm. for that that's why i'm that's why i give them so much credit is because give credit where credit's due i owe i owe those people like so many others yeah tremendous thanks for showing me the way yeah yeah and and it sounded like there's a lot of writing and a lot of um, journaling yeah you know through the yeah. steps and um and so um what what was um i thought there was a um uh, on step four, um, when you were going through step four, that's the inventory, right? Taking your mm -hmm. inventory. Yeah. Um, I think I, what you said was I never stood a chance. And I think my note was it was your most significant takeaway. Um, so there was something about step four where you realized that, you know, you never stood a chance um, had you not, you know, gone into rehab. Yeah, I'm, I still have that paper. I, mean, I kept everything. And that was part of the writing process was going through and transcribing. I transcribed every daily 10 step, which is basically journal. I did a video on my YouTube channel about this. I, every day they, they ask you to write, like mm -hmm. to kick off your day in silence with a small writing thing. Uh, uh, and and it, it was really useful. And then, yeah, step four, you go through all of the things, uh, your resentments, everything that you hate about yourself, hate about others. And I just, I had this moment where I just, almost like guided just my hand was just going and it was just going and it was going and I ran out of space and at the end I just scrolled I never stood a chance and that's how I felt um but that's the process that's a process for so many I mean so many people I can tell you a lot of us go through the similar experiences working a program I mean it works for so many people and that was just one of those I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear that for you that was a good takeaway for me that was just as um uh, impactful is really is really an important day in my mm -hmm. in my journey mm -hmm. so was was there like kind of one one day or or a moment with a lecture maybe talking to one of the counselors um where where like the the, the mindset switch flipped and mm -hmm. you thought I, this is going to be hard. I have a lot of work to do, but I am going to be okay. Was there a time when you had like that aha moment? Yeah, to me, to, it was a leading process. So over time, I'm watching, I'm just taking in everything around me. I'm watching people doing well. I'm watching guys go on and live their lives, other clients getting their clients. So I, I like all these things are coming in. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have that scene uh, at the beach where I go with my friends and I go and I'm just like, I held into the water and I float on my back. And for the first time, one, it's the first time being in the ocean in years, mm -hmm. but then for the first time to feel like calmness and, and peacefulness and, and think like there is, go, there is gonna be a time in my life where things will calm down and, and, and I can relax and, and everything will be okay. And, and that was it. For me, that was the moment. And I still have a very strong spiritual connection to the ocean. Um, my newborn son, his middle name is Kamana, powerful ocean, strong current. It's just water in my life and being there and, and in the presence of all that power. It That was really impactful. And I'm so fortunate. I tell people Sand Island's not like a vacation. <laughs> it's a it's a tough program, but I'm so fortunate that they, we were within walking distance to a beach. Yes. And, and to have that opportunity. And that was it for me. And, and I think that that was really I think that's when I realized things would be okay. And that, that was such a beautiful scene. Um, cause, um, you know, I knew you had gr grown up in Hawaii. So you grew up in the water, in the ocean essentially, um, and then moved. And, and then I, I just thought, Oh man, all those years he wasn't in the ocean and now he's like back, back in the, yeah. I mean, cause the ocean itself is just healing. Yeah, um, and, you know, yeah. you were like home in the ocean. It was it was really beautiful, uh, really a beautiful scene there. Um, so we're just at um, kind of 30 minutes right now. But if you have um, what's one last kind of takeaway um, that you would want to uh, people to get from your book? 
Um, I think that, I think that ultimately this is a story of hope and that people like me do recover. That's one. The other, I would, the other thing that I think that's really important is I am very aware that I was fortunate to have parents that actually cared still to come and find me. I know not everybody has that support group. So I understand that there's a privilege there and I'm, I'm very grateful that I have a, a family that wants me, uh, wanted me to, to succeed and be happy and healthy. So the takeaway is that I want people to know is that if you love an addict or someone that's struggling with addiction, know if you're close to them, they're gonna be, they're gonna push you away because you are the biggest threat to their addiction. The people that love you the most are the biggest threat to an addict's using. And if people can move past that and just say, you know what, let's, let's not let them push me away and let the addiction win. And, and if they can just hold out hope, there's always going to be a chance. I've seen a lot of people recover. I've seen people recover that people thought didn't have a chance. And that's just not true. And so that would be my biggest takeaway is that don't give up, have faith, know that there is good help out there, know that you don't have to have all the answers yourself, that there's wonderful professionals out there that are empathetic and caring, and they can really help your loved one get to a better spot if they're suffering. And, and that's it. And yeah, so I think that that's, that's the story of my life. And that's the goal. I want, I want people to know that. Yes. Well said, well put. It's amazing story um i'm gonna hold it up one more time um one hit away i know it's a little uh, got a glare on it it's available on amazon um yep. again friends of family of, of addicts um, an addict struggling trying to stay clean um jordan's story is is powerful it it will it will give you hope it really will um and just to just to not not give up um so please go get it give it as a gift um it's so beautifully written and um jordan you stay there but thank you everybody um for can I watching add one more? Can I yes add... please do i am putting my heart and soul into a recovery youtube channel it's youtube.com slash one hit away i'm taking a lot of what i've learned about myself in the program and i'm digesting it into content that's relatable to those in recovery. So if you're interested in learning more about my journey and where I'm continuing to go, I would love for you to take, uh, take a look at that. It means yes. a lot to me. And thank yes. you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mahalo, for letting me share and, um, and for inviting me on. It's fortunate. Thank you. Yes, of, of course. And um, I will put that link out, um, you know, with the, you. with the video and stuff. So um, don't go away, but I'm going yeah. to... Um, Thank you again. Aloha, everybody.